Good morning, everybody. I am John W2XS, and um, I can't see you, but uh, welcome. This is the QRP uh, forum, and uh, some of the stuff that I will show you today is stuff I've already showed you in past ones, but there's a bunch of new stuff also. And um, you know, keep in mind that um, QRP is operating with low power, but July 2025 is the peak of the next cycle. So things are going to be really good by then, I hope. And I'm already starting to see um, the bands, the higher bands especially, start to open up. Uh, 12 meters, I've been making a lot of QSOs on 12 meters, which is a very good sign. So it's a good time to start to get into QRP, uh, get, you know, get the dust off, go get that new uh, rig you want, et cetera. Uh, I like to operate QRP rigs at home. And um, this is the QRP corner of my shack. I have three QRP rigs uh, set up, and I have a little switch over here on the right, on the left rather, where uh, I can select the KX2, the K1, or the NorCal 40A, which are these three rigs. And in addition, these uh, switches select either all the QRP rigs, either all my uh, six short wave radios that I listen to or the main radio through a four to one ballon and a one to one ballon, which I need for different bands. And I wrote this up, it's in the handout. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the switch matrix I use, which is phenomenally convenient and easy to use and handy, uh, that's why I wrote it up. So again, my email uh, is on the first slide. Let me know if you have any questions. And I usually start this presentation by showing you pictures of where people operate. And here are some uh, QRP favorites of mine. <clears throat> and you can see that a lot of people are active uh, in parks, uh, on beaches, in backyards, in cars, things like that. Here's Rob W2ITT on a rock in a park. Here's Peter AA2VG who's doing the POTA presentation later on at uh, a lakefront or the sound of front. A couple more pictures of people who are uh, out and about. This is this is where QRP becomes really fun, going out and uh, setting up in a park or somewhere. You'll see some pictures that will will urge you, I think we, I, you know, will spur you to go out and operate. Probably not today, it's 21 degrees here in New York. Uh, here's W1PID who's got his own website. I urge you to go there to look at uh, all the places he's been to. He uh, usually likes to go out with his wife, Judy, they go for walks and bike rides and hikes. He sets up his little QRP rig, either a mountain topper or a KX something, three or something, and then uh, makes a few contacts and writes it up and sends it to the QRPL list. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff there. Very, very uh, nice to share all that with us. Here's a guy, look at the view of that mountain top took his KX2 and fed halfway, which I'll be getting into later on when I do antennas. This guy um, made me dizzy when I first saw this picture. I hope there's a safety net under him, but uh, I, can't, I can't look at that too much. And this guy, W6NIV, I think, because I couldn't verify it, but that's what I had written down. Uh, beautiful spot. It, it gets me to the point where every time I see a picnic table now, no matter where it is, I think, 
hey, I could be operating my QRP rig from there. Uh, N3DL is a lot, uh, you know, goes goes around a lot to a lot of places. And by the way, these calls that I have up here are calls that I've either heard on the air or seen uh, selling some equipment somewhere. So I looked them up. These guys particularly had very interesting qrz.com pages. And that's where I stole, I mean, borrowed these pictures from. Of course, without their knowledge, I hope it's okay. KN2X, nice uh, setup here on the picnic table. Little battery, he's got two kinds of batteries. It looks like the sealed lead acid and a bio NO, lithium uh, iron phosphate, which I'll mention later. Here's the Yellowcraft KX1. And this thing down here is his go kit, I guess you call it, made out of PVC piping. Looks very interesting. K4SWL has a website, qrpr.com. Your first uh, QRP homework for today is to go there and look at everything he has on his website. I think he's got 60 pages. It'll take it, you know, an hour or two or three to go through there without dwelling on anything, but it's um, wonderful. He's got hundreds and hundreds of pictures. These are only two, and uh, these are typical, not typical, but these are great places to do QRP. Uh, love looking at these pictures. K3WWP, this is a guy, you can go see his website. You can look him up on uh, qrz.com first. But I worked him December 14th, and I was his 9,994th 9, QRP QSO. And what this guy has done, he's made at least one QRP CW QSO per day for the last 10,000 days. That's 27 years. It's just an amazing accomplishment. And he's got his website sorted, uh, you know, all the calls are sorted there and how many he made on each band and how many he made with two watts and one watt and five watts. It's just amazing. I doubt if anybody could ever break this record. Let's talk about rigs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because, you know, there are a lot of rigs out there and I'm not going to tell you that you have to buy brand X because there's so many. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased. I'll admit that there's a certain brand I like more than the others because of my experience and things like that. But uh, Yesu, Icom, Zygu, Elecraft, all have really nice radios out there. I prefer a CW radio that is basically silent when switching. I don't like to hear relays when I do my keying. And, um, you know, a lot of these radios are like that. Some have the relays. You can buy kits from Foursquare QRP, QRP kits, QRP labs. They all have kits. This guy, WA3R through R, WA3 R and C, uh, has a bunch of, um, used to have a bunch of things. He's got one radio on his website now, uh, which I'll get to in, on the next page, I believe. Uh, going back to the QRP kits, they have the Tribander, KD1JV designed that, ubiquitous QRP guy. And uh, they have the PFR, portable field radio. Each of these can cover three bands. This yellow one covers um, 40, 30, and 20. Those are the, if you, if you were to ask me what band should I have, you should have those three bands, or at least 40 and 20. I guess the more the merrier. Uh, some of these radios are single band, 
Some are multi-band, some are all bands. Like this RG01 down at the bottom page. I, I put that in because it's a 50 watt radio, but you can dial it down to five. And um, it kind of looks like my old Argosy from Tentec, which I'll get to. I'm gonna go over the history of Tentec, Heathkit and Elecraft in a minute. Uh, my last page of rigs has the uh, WA through three RNC rig on the bottom. That's what they offer now, 250 bucks. Looks like a really nice radio. Got a very nice review. LNR Precision. I'm glad to see that they survived coronavirus. And I believe they're back offering this latest version of the Mountain Topper, MTR4B version 2.3. And this covers four bands, 80, 40, 20, 30. Uh, and it goes up to 13 volts. The old ones used to have to, you used to have to limit them to 12. But it draws 27 milliamps in receive without a big loud signal. And um, that is an amazingly low number. The lower that number, of course, the longer the battery's gonna last if you're sitting there at a park bench. I'm a CW operator mostly. Uh, many, many people do sideband uh, QRP. No problem with that. I've done that also. There are tons of paddles out there. My, uh, my recommendation is to take a look at each one of these and decide which looks nice to you. You can make your own. There's a homebrew paddle over there on the right made out of some uh, paperclip material. K9LU Bulldog is made out of a paperclip also. That's actually a nice, has a nice feel to it. Viroplex Code Warrior. I'm gonna put, put a pin in that when we get to uh, the NorCal Club in the Ellacraft um, history, you'll see why I'm gonna put a pin in that. But, uh, American Morse, N6 ARA, CW Morse, Padlet, all have nice keys. So you can take this presentation later when it's available on the website and um, just look at each one of these um, places. I'd like to point out that this guy, K4IBZ, doesn't sell these paddles, but I was listening to him the other day on 40 and um, he mentioned that he was using a tweezer paddle. So it's it's actually a paddle made out of a tweezer. I went to his QRZ page and this guy has something like 65 different rigs. And he uses a different rig each day. So, you know, go take a look at uh, his, his QRZ page if you wanna see what he's talking about. Now we'll talk about accessories. The more things that are built into the radio, the less you have to carry around. Some of these are important. Some of these, you know, you may not need at the moment. A dummy load is something all of us should have. The testing, some of these dummy loads have a little uh, connection so you can put your voltmeter there and measure voltage so you can actually calculate how many watts you're putting out. So you can measure your power while the radio is connected to a dummy load. Uh, I just did that the other day with my QRP rigs. RF output watt meter, we should all have one of those somewhere, either built in or external. Earbuds or a speaker. It's uh, amazing how handy a speaker is to have inside the rig. But if you don't have one in the rig, you need to add one. BNC to binding posts. Uh, this is uh, Wayne from Ellicraft's favorite accessory. He says in his manuals for the KX2 and the KX3, you could just throw out a 25 foot wire, connect, uh, connect two of them, one to each pin here, and go on the air from 40 to 10 meters. I've actually done that. It does work. When I get to antennas, I'll try to tell you that you should have the right size antenna for the right band. 
uh, keyers, antenna tuners, carrying cases, all uh, either necessary things or nice to have. A ballon is something you'll need when you go from uh, your 50 ohm BNC coax uh, output connector to the uh, two leads of a balanced uh, antenna, like a ladder line or a twin lead. Here's a little meter that measures DC input volts and amps. You need a log book, of course, piece of paper. And this is a simple passive audio filter. Some of the rigs like the Elecraft have an audio peak filter, APF in them, which I use almost all the time. But in the past, I've built this uh, little passive um, capacitor and inductor in series based on a circuit in November 77 QST. I wrote this up, it's in the handout. Uh, if you're interested, it's good for boat anchors too, to eliminate the hiss and the hum and things like that. Briefly, let's talk about power. Uh, I used to have a selection of sealed lead acid batteries, two volts per cell, 12 volts typically. Uh, they're very heavy and um, they work, but they're not in vogue anymore, I don't think. And the problem with these batteries is I bought one from Radio Shack recently and I realized that it must have been sitting around in the warehouse for a long period of time because it came to me under 10 volts and I really couldn't get a good charge out of it. Once they go under 10 volts, their lifetime will be limited from what I see. Uh, in any event, if you have a good one, just get the good charger. And these are tri-mode chargers. It dumps a lot of current if the battery is low. Then it eases up on the current until it's fully charged, and then it trickle currents to keep the uh, called a float charge. And Battery Tender is just one of those brands. Then there's the lithium ion, which is in the KX2 built in, or lithium ion phosphate, which is what mostly is on the bioNLpower.com website. This is the way to go, in my opinion. Just go to bioenopower.com, look at all the different selections they have, figure out how many amp hours you want, uh, and um, you, you know they have a complete kit with the cables, the charger, the appropriate charger, which is very important to these batteries. Don't try to uh, jury rig the charger, get the right one. Uh, NIMH is an older technology, I don't use those anymore, except uh, here and there, the different things I have in the house. Alkaline batteries, uh, they're 1.5 volts per cell. And uh, here's the amp hour ratings for the typical batteries we have in, in our lives. But um, I don't use these anymore. I don't like putting eight uh, batteries in my little battery holder to take them out on the field. Now that I have exposure to the lithium ion and lithium ion phosphate. Here's a write up from K4SWL about how uh, good lithium ion, lithium iron phosphate batteries are. And I'll let you read this later, but it's giving all the advantages of LIFEPO which is what BioNO is selling these days. More expensive, but cost-effective in the long run. That's the bottom line. They're light, easy to carry, easy to charge. You know, seal lead acid batteries sometimes take a day or two to charge. The uh, batteries of today, lithium ion, things like that, just take a couple of hours. Uh, now, this is something that I kind of accidentally came upon, which basically changed my life as far as power supplies go and as far as noise floors go. So this is an example of switching power supply. And 
you can buy two types of power supplies for your ham radios. One is the linear, big, heavy, um, Astron type of power supply, which I have and I recommend. Or you can buy a switcher, which um, is small, light, easy to carry, but because of the switching, they generate noise. And this power supply, the reason I put this picture up is these guys are being honest. RNL Electronics. Uh, and by the way, their part number is RLPS30M, which means RNL Electronics, that's a power supply, 30 amps uh, maximum. M means there's a meter on it. But look at this control they have called a shifter. That indicates that they know this power supply is a switching power supply. They've probably tried to filter it out as best they can, but it's going to generate some noise in your receiver. And here they're saying, if it does, just turn this knob and the shifting frequency will move up or down and hopefully it'll get out of where you're listening. But that's not the only problem with these switching power supplies, as I'll show you in a second. The QRP, this is highly recommended, the Pro Audio Engineering, and you can see right on the power supply, low RFI power supply. So he's done some work to try to eliminate all the switching uh, transients and things like that. And it's good for most of our QRP rigs, four amps maximum, 14.4 volts DC output. This is a good power supply to have. And here's why um, I said noise floor before. One day, I was uh, I came down to the shack and turned on the radio, and all of a sudden I could hear some very weak signals on 20 meter. I couldn't hear them the day before. And um, I said, hmm, that's interesting. Then I plugged in my printer because I had accidentally unplugged it because I wanted to move it. And lo and behold, the noise floor jumped up uh, to in between S5 and S6, as you can see on the left side of the slide here. So on the right side of the slide, the printer was unplugged and the noise floor was down around the S3 mark. And you can see these two little signals here. There's one and there's the other. Those are perfectly work workable signals. But on the left, it's completely covered up by the stupid printer, which I'm assuming is the stupid power, uh, switching power supply in the printer. And what I'm recommending to you is to go around your shack, pulling out all the different wall warts. If you have a uh, spectrum analyzer or a pan adapter or scope or something like this, you can see your noise floor and see if it makes any difference. This was very surprising to me. And now I have uh, an outlet strip with a power switch on it. I turn off the printer and a couple of lights that I have whose wool warts cause this same kind of noise. Now we get into uh, the antenna point uh, portion of the show. <clears throat> and again, this is a little updated from last uh, time, <clears throat> excuse me, but so important that I have to make the point again that um, the antenna is, I think, in my humble opinion, the most important part of the portable setup. And we have this thing called efficiency which is a measure of how much power you put into the uh, antenna and how much actually gets radiated into a signal. This is not something that we normally know how to calculate or even what it does. And it's not something that cust uh, companies like MFJ or these antenna manufacturers broadcast uh, because it's usually not a good number on some of these very short antennas. And just as, a, as an example, 50% efficiency means when you transmit 10 watts into an antenna, only five are going to get radiated. 
the rest of the power gets eaten up by losses and things like that. So it's not something you're aware of when you're operating. It has nothing to do with SWR. You can have a perfect one-to-one -one match and the antenna is still a lossy, low efficiency antenna. And that's the point I was trying to make on some of these articles um, that you see in the handout. I'll get to that in a second. So here's my recommended antenna list. There are many, many, many different types of antennas out there, but if you're gonna spend the time to go out into the field, you might as well take an antenna that is gonna work. The first antenna on the list is the NFED half wave. And on 40 meters, it's 66 feet of wire. You need a 49 to one matching transformer. You don't need a tuner. It'll work on 40, 20, 15, and 10. Uh, and it's basically a half wave dipole fed at the center. I mean, at the end, you can feed a half wave dipole in the center, off center. Some of us use that kind of antenna or at the end. And dipoles can be greater than 95% efficient. So most of your power, most of your precious QRP power is turned into a radiated electromagnetic wave. And in the handout, I mentioned standing waves, and I used to have a lot of time talking about the theory, things like that. Uh, but it's all in the handout. I put all of that in the handout. I took it, took it out of this presentation. But that's a really, really good, simple, cheap antenna that uh, I'll show you on the next slide. The next one is an NFEN random length wire. It's not a half wave, which means the characteristics change. I'll get to that when we get to that page. Center fed 40 meter dipole with twin lead or ladder line, my favorite antenna in the whole world. Magnetic loop, short loaded whip. Okay, so here's the end fed half wave antenna. Much more information is in the handout. Uh, really, really good antenna, efficient, simple, no antenna tuner needed. So you could take your little mountain topper or your whatever rig you have, you don't need a tuner, hook it up to this 49 to one matching transformer connected to the end of a 66 foot wire or 132 foot wire or a 33 foot wire, depending on what band bands you wanna work. You need a cheap support pole. It's not handling any heavy insulator here. It's just the middle of the wire. You're setting up a standing wave on the wire. The current is in the middle. That's where the radiation mostly is. So you get that nice and high in the inverted V configuration and you sit back and you enjoy the pileup you'll create when you start to get on the air. Here's the end fed wire with a nine to one transformer. Again, it's almost the same thing as the half wave wire, but it's a different length. And now we have a different scenario going on where in the end fed half wave wire, we did not have to worry about reactants or tuning or things like that. Now we have reactants. If the antenna is too short, it looks like a capacitor and you need an inductor to balance it out. If it's too long, you need a capacitor to balance it out and all that. That's what the antenna tuner does. And since the antenna tuner is down in the rig, usually, any piece of coax that goes from to the from the rig to this thing, this nine to one transformer is mismatched. Therefore, it could be a little lossy. So this whole system might not be as efficient as the NFED half wave, which is very efficient. But it's good to try. You know, certain wire lengths are recommended. Here they are on the bottom. Here's a link you can go to to look at those lengths. Here's my favorite antenna in the world, uh, 40 meter, I mean, for portable use, 40 meter dipole fed with uh, twin lead using laundry, reel, laundry reels to 
roll up the wire. Only takes a few seconds to get this uh, up and running. Not a few seconds, a few minutes. So you can take this down to the beach, put up the pole, put this up in the air, stretch out the laundry reels of the wire and the rope, and um, you're good to go. You can work any band from 40 to six. And uh, this is an all band antenna. The other ones are multi band antennas. Does this have any downsides? The only downside is that the pole is now supporting uh, an insulator and a feed line. So it's probably a good idea to have a little bit heavier duty pole. And at the higher frequencies, you start to get these lobes in the radiation pattern, which is either a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing if your signal that you're trying to work is in one of these lobes, because there's gain associated with that. It's a bad thing if the signal you want to work is in the null, but you can always rotate this thing by hand at the beach and things like that. So this is my favorite antenna to put uh, to put up for portable use. Here's a, um, and it's in the handout. The handout has a complete description of this thing with links and all kinds of stuff. Here's a guy, WV0H, who made a similar antenna using uh, wire, and he uses the wire as the feed line also, so there's no twin lead to have to track down, which is unobtainium these days. Magnetic loops, some people like magnetic loops. Um, they're not that efficient on the lower bands, but they're small and they're easy to carry around. CQ magazine, you had an article, you can make one for 35 bucks. I just looked at a website yesterday from Precision RF. They make a loop that handles 1.5 kilowatt. It's $3,000. So uh, there you go. Here's the loaded whip that I told everybody not to buy because it's so inefficient. And then I went ahead, went ahead and bought one. Um, this is the Elecraft version, AX1. They now just came out with the AX2, which covers uh, one band at a time, the AX2. AX1 covers 20, 17, and 15 switchable. And I've brought that thing to the beach. I've used it on a boat. It's very, very compact and easy to carry around. It's also very low radiation efficiency, especially on the lower bands. But it does work, kind of, and it's easy to carry, and a lot of people recommend it. I didn't at first, but I just think it's good for convenience. MFJ sells them, things like that. I'm going to talk about some history now. I'll have to go a little fast. This is um, the most beautiful rig in the world, the Tentec Triton 4. And I can't get into it because I need to go into the history. Tentec came out in 1969 with these little modules. Then they came out with a rig using those modules called the Paramite. PM1, PM2, PM3, PM3A. Uh, they rated the power as two watts input. Back in these days, people were rating power as input power, which was kind of dumb. But that's they didn't have a good way to measure RF output power. So this is the, the rig that started the QRP ball rolling and um, launched Tentec into the world, basically. Then Tentec came out with all these different Argonauts. I don't have time to go into the difference between each one. Let me just say that this Model 505, the first one to come out was groundbreaking. It launched uh, a portable radio that was actually good. And, um, you know, five watts, that was the input power, which means the output power was like half of that, two and a half watts or so. And they made improvements and they kept up-to-date technology as they went along. Finally ended with this one, the Argonaut 6, which 
would have been a great radio, except they left out 12 meters and 60 meters. And um, I think those are very important bands these days for us to use, especially as the solar cycle is starting to improve. They had the Argosy over here, which had a switch on the back, um, 50 or five watts. That was very convenient. This was a very nice analog rig. Century, uh, I'm sorry, this, yeah, Century 22 below it. Direct conversion receiver, which meant you heard both sides of the zero beat. Uh, otherwise, it was a nice little thing. These are going for way too much money now. So uh, I can't recommend it. It's a little behind the times as far as I'm concerned. They have, they still seem to be selling this rig, the Rebel, which is based on an Arduino. And it's a five watt, 40 and 20 meter jumper programmable uh, two band radio that you can hook your computer up to and make nice changes to if you're so inclined. This was the end of their QRP radio, it makes me kind of sad. They had to have a QRP presence. And uh, so they started importing this uh, 4020, the R4020, which was the same as the UKIT's HV1 in what I see, but did not cover 30 meters because it didn't meet the uh, requirements for 30. Here's another kit they had. This is an ad from 1972 where they said they made this little amplifier for the organ up. Computer estimated life of the output transistors is 25.7 years. That was in 1972. So here we are 50 years later. I wonder if they're sorry they ever came up with this estimate. Although their presence isn't there now in the ham radio world. Hopefully it will come back someday. Let's talk about Heathkit. First, I want to show you this link. If you want to go back and look at some of the old Heathkit catalogs, here's the link for that. And I call this link the best link ever because you can go back, look at all the catalogs. You can look at every issue of 73 magazine. You can look at all the old issues of popular electronics, Electronics Illustrated, hundreds and hundreds of different magazines and things. You'll be there for at least a year looking at this link. So take a look at that when you get a chance. The first QRP rig, they didn't call it QRP at the time, but it was five watts input. So it qualifies, in my opinion, as being a QRP radio. Uh, really popular at the time in the 50s, late 50s, I guess. You could talk to your neighbor down the block but uh, probably not really good for today. Then they came out with the HW7, direct conversion receiver, very, very severe overload problems. W1FB, my QRP hero, among others, uh, tried to write articles on how to modify this, but um, not a great radio. It was superseded by the HW8, which is a direct conversion receiver also, but much improved circuitry, and it has something called a premixed VFO. What that means is that all the different bands, covered four bands, they all tune in the same direction with the same dial calibration. Some people changed 80 meters to 30 meters and 6KR. Put a pin in that. Uh, Look, I'm going to mention that again soon. Here's the HW9. It was their last, one of their last kits. Uh, had a lot of promise, but there were a lot of design flaws in this thing. And um, there are modifications listed in QRP Power, QRP Classics, and in the back issues of the NorCal QRP Club uh, newsletter, which I'll get to in a second. So this was a disappointing radio to me. It was also, when I decided to buy one of these, they had closed up their shop where I had bought uh, a kit right before they closed. So that was in the mid eighties. Now I'm gonna quickly talk about Elecraft. 
N6KR was one of the founders of Elecraft, but here we are in 1984, before Elecraft, and here's a QST article about somebody, N6KR, modifying his HW8, took out the 80 meter band, put in the 30 meter band, and here's all the capacitors and coils and all the detail you needed to make the change. So here's, in, in, from what I see, one of N6KR's bursting onto the scene to our P world. 1988, WA3RNC, who we saw some of his rigs on the rigs page, he came out with this article, the Neophyte. <clears throat> that was a very simple direct conversion receiver, covered 80 and 40 meters. It used two chips, NE602 LM386. Basically, this chip was used in the analog cell phones in vogue at that time. <clears throat> and three minutes, he, John. You got really? three minutes. Start wrapping oh. it up, please. So I'm going to pick it up. Here's uh, Elecraft, the Safari. This was the greatest rig in the world in 1990. And you can see it's got built-in tuner, meter, keyer, paddles, AGC, battery. Then he came out with, uh, this was Wayne, he moved back to California, joined the NorCal PRP Club, came out with all these rigs, including the NorCal 40A, Wilderness Sierra, things like that. Here are the back issues. Here's a link to the back issues of the NorCal QRP rigs. For homework, go there, read all uh, 10 or 11 files, 10 years of history. Here's the QRP, uh, here's the Elecraft history. I just have time to point out in the third or fourth ad down here, they came out with the KX1, very, very stable radio. Then they came out with the KX3, then the KX2. These are called SDRs with zero IFs, basically direct conversion radios. Then I have to mention the K3, direct uh, down conversion analog SDR architecture. Then the K4, direct sampling SDR. That's the latest and the greatest. Some of the newer ICOMs are direct sampling. All the processing from the very beginning to the very end is done in the digital world. K3, most of the processing is in the digital world, but there's analog circuitry. QRP guys, QRP kits, soda beams, all uh, really interesting places to go. Don't skimp on the antenna. Let the entire wave get radiated. You'll see that in the handout. Choose CW or SSB. Have fun. That's what this is all about. And that's it. So um, sorry to rush at the end there, but uh, as I usually do, I have too many slides in here, too little um, time. So next year I'm going to I'm going to implore for an hour and a half, and uh, see what Neil and Peter tell me tell me to do. Anyway, uh, if anybody has any questions, you could uh, ask them now, or just send me an email at any time, and take a look at the handout, please. Tons and tons and tons of links in there. Uh, It'll keep you busy for at least the next year. All right, did nice job. Okay, Peter? You and did great. And uh, there weren't any real questions per se, but some very uh, positive comments. Oh, good. John, yeah, terrific. I mean, a lot of detail, a lot of sources, really fantastic. Great job, John. Thank you. Well, I guess people will have to go back and look at the presentation to. Uh, see what I couldn't cover, but, you know, go through some of the links and uh, I think you'll enjoy yourself. Okay, we got to move on and get uh, get things ready for uh, Don. Okay. Thanks, Have a everybody. good day, John. Thank you very much. And thanks for your help, guys.